course, people come to see the films at a festival. But let's be honest, people also come to see the movie stars that come to town to promote those films. Today on the show, with the ongoing U.S. actor strike and writer strike, what's this year's Toronto International Film Festival going to look like? I'm Talia Schlanger, sitting in for Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, we are about two weeks away from TIFF. September 7th is the big kickoff, and the full lineup is out now. It's definitely one of the biggest events in the world of cinema, and it has been for more than 40 years. It can be such a special thing, right? In a normal year, maybe you're sitting behind a director at a world premiere, and they're watching their film with an audience for the first time. In the next aisle, the star of the movie is sitting right there munching popcorn just like you are. But this year, there's the writer's strike and the actor strike happening in Hollywood. We've got two film culture critics here to talk about how the festival will be different this year and what they're most excited to see. So Rad Simon Pillay and Sarah Ty Black are with me now. Hey, you two. Hello. Hey. hey. So Rad, before we dig into some of the big films coming to TIFF this year, can you briefly give us a sense of how the ongoing strikes in Hollywood might affect who and what we see at TIFF? Yeah, I mean, and, and if you asked me this question, like when these strikes began, I would have been like, oh, TIFF is going to have absolutely no stars coming. And that's kind of been the big narrative. But I've been realizing, like, that's not necessarily the case, right? Because if you think about TIFF's lineup, I mean, first of all, 70% of it is international films anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So out of the, but out of the American movies, most of them aren't affiliated with the studios that people are striking against, right? They're not necessarily, they're not made by Disney or Netflix or Apple and all of that stuff. They're usually independent productions. So you do have like a fairly star studded lineup of films that are totally independent, like, you know, movie starring Kate Blanchett and Kate Winslet and, uh, you know, Anna Kendrick and stuff like that. Right. So that's, that's a bit of a gray area. Also a gray area. You have movie, like, you know, a studio like A24, which is kind of the boutique trendy studio makes a lot of great movies. Their their movies like they, they they've actually agreed to the union terms like WGA and SAG terms. So they're not the people are not striking against them. So their movies you know, could technically prom uh, bring their stars out. So they have a movie called Dick's the Musical that stars Nathan Lane and Meg Thee Stallion. And I'm like, okay, yeah, bring that on. <laughs> okay. And then they have like, um, then you have these this this funny situation where you have like movies that are directed by stars. So the Anna Kendrick movie, the Michael Keaton movie. So like, so all of these together are movies that should technically have exceptions that where the stars should technically have no issues coming out. But... The big but is even if you're allowed to come out, what about the optics, yep. right? Like, you know, like what is that? How does that look for, like? How do you feel about coming out, uh, you know, sh showing up on the red carpet? If people don't understand, do they feel like you? it looks like you're not showing solidarity with the cause? So I think that might prevent some people. So it is like this funny gray area that I know that a lot of people behind the scenes are trying to work out and they're trying to figure out and they're trying to hope that they hope that, you know, they could bring out their stars and Tiff will be will have like these these snazzy red carpets, snazzy red carpets. You can only imagine. <laughs> Imagine, you can only imagine the, what like what the breakfast cake table or the coffee table looks like for like Anna Kendrick or Meg Thee Stallion or any of the people who might be <laughs> wrestling with this, talking about it with their partners, with their colleagues. It, it is yeah. it is such a big thing, and cool. optics are a huge part of it. Yeah, and let me. And I'll, I'll even add like there's like a lot of disagreement within Hollywood over the idea of exceptions. Exactly. Because, like, you, you, we've heard Sarah Silverman voice this as well. It's like like why should we be giving these movie these independent productions exceptions? Because even if they're not affiliated with a streamer now, those movies will eventually end up on a streamer. So that's that the, again, all of that is messing it up, clouding it up. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah. Tiff's out, full lineup is out now. Sarah Ty, I want to know what you make of it. I'm so glad that they announced that little Nas X doc because otherwise I was feeling a little underwhelmed. I was feeling a need for glamour. You know, this is like a festival that's offered me the privilege of like seeing icons, icons to me in the flesh, people like Grace Jones, people like Andre Leon Talley, RIP, that when I first saw the list ahead of the recent announcements, I was like, oh, okay. Kate Blanchett then. Um, and also like, as someone who ha also has the privilege of living in Toronto, I mostly look forward to like what's going on at Platform, what's happening at Midnight Madness, which is like 
where fun is allowed <laughs> during TIFF. So for me, I'm kind of more about like the 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 counter audience vibes in TIFF and also like the TIFF Next Wave selects. I think TIFF Next Wave is the future of film at TIFF and they're the best thing that happens at TIFF every year. And I love them. Can we have a just a moment of of shout out for Midnight Madness that you just mentioned, mm-hmm. which is these are like late night screenings of super weird films, often like horror films, and you will never have as much fun seeing a movie as you do going to like a midnight screening with a bunch of other strange yes, people. Yes, and you're allowed to laugh and cry and yell and generally emote like a human. <laughs> are they are they still tossing around the beach? It's been a while since I've been able to stay up until midnight, but are they, are they still tossing around the beach volleyball? Rad said, I'm a dad. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine being allowed to make noise at a movie theater yeah, yeah. There with other people. Whoa, <laughs> crazy. Uh, Rad, any any big surprises for you in the lineup this year? Well, you know, I'll echo like what Sarah Tai said about like feeling deflated with the initial announcements because I definitely felt that, especially because like a lot of my fave American filmmakers weren't part of the initial lineup. Like when a few a couple weeks ago, when TIFF announced kind of their big gala and special presentations lineups, uh, that same week, Venice announced their lineup. And I was like, oh, mm. great. David Fincher's The Killers, Michael Mann's Ferrari, Sofia Coppola's Priscilla. All of those movies are going to Venice and skipping TIFF. And then on top of that, afterwards, we found out that, you know, Todd Haynes's movie, uh, mm. May, December, is skipping TIFF and going to New York Film Festival. And I mean, I, I saw Killers of the Flower Moon, Scorsese's movie at Cannes, but that's also like, but not bothering. So, you know, when I saw that all the greats, all the American greats that I'm looking forward to decided not to show up at the festival, I was just like, did we hurt you? Like, what it am is doing? feeling like very Canadian derogatory. What you, yeah, right? Like, like, like they're we, anti, like they're making an anti-Canadian statement by skipping no, out. No, just like tip. how you know we can't get the same stuff as the states. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> enough. But that was it. Was extremely deflating, and so I was actually like, I was a bit down. But then, like Sarah Ty said, that like all of a sudden Tiff's pivot in the late breaking kind of announcements, I was actually really surprised and impressed by because like, okay, you have the situation where all of these greats are skipping the festival. You also have the situation where you can't get a lot of actors out to the strike. So let's just program a bunch of rock stars. We can't get movie stars, so we'll get, like she said, Little Nas X, but also Nickelback, even though I can't fathom listening to Nickelback anymore. The fact that they have a documentary starring Nickelback and they bring that out to the festival, the fact that they're reuniting the talking heads for this anniversary, the, the Talking Heads in conversation with Spike Lee for the, the the 4K restoration of Stop Making Sense, which I'm sure you heard is the greatest concert doc ever. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, they bring out Pedro Motivar for an in conversation. Like, I think they did a great job of pivoting in a in a crisis situation and still, you know, p- uh, curating these events that are making me look forward to to them. But look, look forward to the festival, but also looking forward to the after party. <laughs> <laughs> that that you'll tell us all about after you've been well, invited, I, if, if, right? Gonna, <laughs> I'll be clawing at the door, and if I get in, I'll let you know. Okay, yeah, we're waiting. We're waiting. Um, I want to talk about some of the Canadian films that are premiering at TIFF this year. Uh, we asked both of you to give us one film that you are really looking forward to. Rad, what's your pick and why? Um, okay, so I'm cheating here because I've actually seen a version of this movie. It's called Humanist Vampire Seeking Consenting Suicidal Person. I think I got that right. Lots of words in that title. Wow, um, that's a title. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's it's a, a French Canadian feature debut by Ariane Louise Size, and it, it it's basic. It's about a a young teenage vampire who doesn't have it in herself to kill her prey, but then she finds a suicidal person, a young suicidal man who's willing to give his life for her to help her survive. But then you know. By by connecting with her, he finds a new reason to live. So it's actually a really sweet coming of age story, and like a dark and twisted. And I think a lot of people are going to get a real get a real kick out of that. I saw the trailer. It also looks darkly <laughs> funny. Like it, it is very looks funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is. It is. It is hilarious. Okay, well there you go. That's a unique. That's a unique movie. Like that's the kind of movie that you go to TIFF <laughs> to see for the first time. I think Sarah Ty, what's what's your pick for a Canadian film you're excited about? My pick, because I'm trying to heal my inner child in the wake of climate catastrophe, housing crisis, unlivable wages, Mr. Dress Up, The Magic of Make Believe. (laughs) I need it. I need this documentary about Mr. Dress Up. If it's not good, I don't know what I'll do. Um, I just need it. And I heard they've recreated the set. Of course, this is a documentary about the life of Mr. Dress Up, CBC childhood lore the understudy of mr rogers so you know the pedigree is right i don't if you don't know who mr rogers is i don't like stop listening right now and just go on youtube because like 
just do it. I need this. I need this. We all need this. I need this like how I need to see the Nelvana polar bear go across the screen. Maybe <laughs> there'll be a pre-show. Like, I just, I need some soothing media. I want to be at the after party of the Mr. Dress Up movie, too. Totally. It's milk and cookies and blankets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That actually, that, yeah, that would be that would be pretty fun. I'm excited. I'm excited about Seven Veils, the um, the Adam McGowan film that's having its yeah. world. I love an Adam McGowan film, and he uh, he directed that famous production of Salome in '96 here. And then this new film is like about a director who's directing Salome, and it's Amanda Seyfried. That sounds exciting. Mm-hmm. To I me. stand Amanda Seyfried, and I like yeah. that they're they're hosting that premiere at at the is it at the Opera or at the I think the Canadian like, Opera Company. Yeah, is that yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that that's exciting. A sort of meta a meta experience. <laughs> yeah. Okay, love it. Quite a variety. We've got a vampire helping somebody, you know, rediscover their will to live. We've got Mister Dress Up. We've got. Salome and Canadian Opera Company. Um, this is also, let's, let's get back to this. This is an important moment for writers and for actors in Hollywood. And they're on strike right now uh, in a bid for better pay, better working conditions. With all of that in mind, Rad, I want to know what you think the spirit of the festival is going to be like this year. Well, I mean, I think the spirit should be celebratory. You know, I mean, first of all, like the fact that you have like a starless festival, I think it's great that you could then now just like get get away from the whole industry red carpet vibe of it and actually appreciate the work of artists. Um, so that's one thing. And I think that if you if you are in if you align with the cause of these people, there's no better way to see their work than at the festival, because at the festival, you just appreciate the work and you're not actually profiting any of the big companies because, uh, you know, it's it, your your money, your your ticket dollars goes towards the non profit that is TIFF. And also, I mean, I would just think that I hope like like when people do go attend this kind of thing, I think they, they, they consider sort of our our current climate as writers and, and media and stuff, right? Because you see that if you go on Instagram right now, when you try to post your red carpet selfies and stuff, you'll notice that all the Canadian media companies are blocked on Instagram and all that stuff. And that's all part of that's all part of this moment where Canadian media, Canadian writers are trying to make sure that their their work is not exploited by these big tech giants like Google and Apple and Meta and all that stuff um and 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 that's the fight and i think that fight is very much related to the writer's strike right they're fighting against big tech companies that are exploiting their labor we're canadian media we're trying to fight to make sure that we get our fair share from these tech companies so i hope like people kind of connect the dots there as they're attending this festival and celebrating the work yeah i want to know sarah last word to you what do you think about that i mean there's there are probably a lot of movie fans that are still trying to make sense of of the strikes and what it could mean for them anything that you hope people are thinking about or that people should be thinking about as they watch these films this year? Yeah, I mean, I know it's easy for us as movie watchers, especially like for folks who aren't located specifically in LA to like detach ourselves from any kind of responsibility to like a billion dollar industry like film and TV. Like if we're watching like a fast series and we watch a car go through one Abbey Dowie Abu Dhabi Tower to another Abu Dhabi Tower, or is it a Dubai Tower? I don't know. We look at that and we're like, what does that have to do with me? You know, I, I think we might start to forget there's these are workplaces for a lot of folks who are often just working class folks going to their job every day and there's serious labor issues. And more than that, of course, I hope that we kind of take this as a blueprint for past and future strikes and we see, you know what these issues are outside of like maybe the celebrities showing up at the picket line. Yeah. Like it's nice to see Colin Farrell and his like little got to be gelled down hair, but like, how are these strikes operating? How is this business trying to undermine them? Cough, cough, Barbie movie advertising. Um, and how can we kind of like use what we're learning in this for future strikes? Cough, cough. We'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for talking with me today. appreciate it. Thanks for having us. For sure. Sarah Ty Black is a freelance film critic. You can read their work on CBC Arts and The Globe and Mail. Rad Simon Pillay is a film critic for CBC and CTV's Your Morning. This year's Toronto International Film Festival is happening from September 7th to 17th. I'm Talia Schlanger, sitting in for Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. There's a, a new documentary series out right now, and it centers around a very specific type of job, one that if you have a phone, I'm going to guess you might have some strong feelings about. This is the hardest job you will ever have. I'm a scumbag. I'm annoying you at dinner time, and you're like, F- you, stop calling me. That's from HBO's docuseries, 
telemarketers. Uh, It's created by two former telemarketers, and it's an expose of a billion-dollar scam by the company where they used to work. It's called Civic Development Group. The series is getting a lot of attention right now, not just because it has this incredible behind-the-scenes footage, but also because it takes a very unconventional approach to the true crime genre. To talk about all of this, we have cold-called Catherine Van Arendonk. She's a culture critic for Vulture. Hey, Catherine. Hello. Hi. So I sketched out the premise briefly, but can you describe what this frankly bonkers series telemarketers is about? It is. It is so bonkers. It's it's fantastic. So the the general premise of the series, it's three episodes long, is that um, years ago, decades ago, a young kid who had dropped out of high school, his name is Sam Lipminstein, had dropped out of high school. He lived in New Jersey and needed to get a job and so got a job at uh, a company doing telemarketing. He didn't know anything about the company, had no idea um, what he was walking into. And then as a young kid, you know, he's not even 18 yet, um, looks around this workplace and says, this is crazy. What is happening here? Um, the Not just the the actual work of it which he learns is about calling up people and using all of these very carefully scripted techniques to get money from them but the workplace culture of it because uh they absolutely did not care what you did in these office buildings as long as you were making your quota and so as a young kid he pulls out a fairly cheap camcorder and just starts recording everything he sees interviewing the people he's working with and then sits on that footage for quite a long time. And then as an adult comes back and revisits it, both the footage that he shot as a younger kid and what he now is able to look at with adult eyes and say, wait a minute, this was incredibly illegal and a huge scam. And what is the current situation of this whole uh, of this whole enterprise. It's, it's so fascinating. It's fascinating. And it's really, I mean, it's a true tri- true crime documentary that somebody did not know that they were making at, at that time, really. The genre of true crime has become incredibly popular lately. Um, and before we talk more about telemarketers, I just want to know your, your take. Why do you think that we are so obsessed with true crime right now? Oh, man. I mean, there are a lot of answers to this. And I think I think one of them is that actually we like to think of ourselves as being obsessed with true crime right now, but we have been obsessed with true crime for centuries. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as there was media, people were writing up, you know, like British broadsheets of of the the most famous murderers. You used to be able to buy a calendar in Victorian England of like the most famous murderers. So like this is nothing new. Um, But I think right now true crime has uh, has such a moment in part because we are both living in this time when we are extremely alarmed about a lot about life. And there is uh, ironically something that feels kind of safe and comfortable about being able to say, like, here's a horrendous thing. And I I get to feel the uh, emotion that that brings up in me. But I, while at the same time holding it from a safe distance, any true crime thing that you are watching is being mediated. It is a story that someone is telling to you. Mm. So you get that comfort and you get that like shock and horror at the same, at the same time. I mean, I think the other thing about true crime that is happening right now is because media um, has become so democratized. Everyone records everything with their phones. We have a different relationship with evidence than we used to. We have a different relationship with the idea of objective narrators than we used to. So the genre has also changed a lot in the last decade. Yeah. The people are familiar with shows like Making a Murder, with Jinx, with with Serial. Uh, what are some of the true crime cliches that we're seeing? Oh, man. I mean, I think anyone who looks at uh, a pretty standard true crime docu series on say Netflix is going to feel like all right I, I know what this is going to look like there's going to be uh, recreation scenes of the crime sometimes they're going to be pretty well done sometimes they're going to be terribly done there are going to be drone shots of the uh, surrounding area so that you can see like forest drone shots of forest maybe a road you're also going to get that visual timeline where you're sort of watching the days or the whatever it is sort of moving back and forth and then I think the standard it's so standard that we don't even really think of it as a trope, but it is, is the talking head shot, right? The person sitting in a chair and looking straight at the camera and at answering questions that you may or may not actually be hearing them get asked from a producer. That, that 
is it feels like just like grammar like we don't even really notice it but it is a choice that any docuseries is doing and i'm always fascinated by how those shots are set up what is included what isn't how they fit in with the rest of a series yeah so what back to the series telemarketers what is this series doing so differently than other crime shows so it has all of these it has some of these things um there are talking headshots there are, but because it comes from the framing of this man who really only came to fully understand what this project was later in life, it feels so different because you're watching this footage that's been shot by somebody who is led only by his own interest as a teenager and not this kind of pseudo objective documentarian perspective. He narrates it. Uh, and so you're also getting this really rich text of sort of him looking back on his younger self. And so you get both the emotion that he felt then and the emotion he feels now. The other thing is that he, a lot of the series is about this friendship that he has with a man who he met there. His name is Patrick J. Pespis, who also becomes very interested in being a journalist, but neither of them have that, again, that sort of like professional veneer of what these things are supposed, I'm using air quotes, supposed to look like. And so you are led by their enthusiasm, their disgust, their fascination with this. And you sort of realize like, oh, a a true crime documentary could look like a completely different thing. It's so great. Yeah, I should say it's like some of what we see, like shaky, like weirdly kind of badly but somehow artistically framed footage of this office where people are like there a guy has like a baby turtle in a cup and somebody else is like doing drugs in the, in the bathroom and there's casual nudity and it just looks like a a total train wreck of an office environment plus giant corruption and like basically stealing money f- f- from people um yeah yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And then, as the series goes on, yeah. you get footage that is shot more, more uh, close to our current contemporary moment. So they get older; they they understand how to use a camera differently, and you sort of watch that happen. But they're still very much them, which yeah. is so great to watch. It's amazing. We just have like a minute left, but I want to just get to this part of things. True crime often revolves around a whodunit. There's a bad guy who needs to get caught without giving too much away. How does telemarketers handle that aspect? Yeah, so it's really, really fascinating to watch what feels like this um, major scandal happen. And then in the first episode, you realize like, oh, there was already sort of a legal approach to this. And things shift quite dramatically in the next two episodes. Um, By the end, I found it because it is very much about not just the telemarketers, but the charities, including the Fraternal Order of Police, who they are raising money for. And it is very satisfying to kind of watch their understanding of like who the villain is in this story start to shift. Well, I can't wait to see the next two episodes. The first one was wild. Thank you for, for being here to talk about it, Catherine. It's my pleasure. Catherine Van Arendonk is a culture critic for Vulture and a regular here on Commotion. Telemarketers is streaming now on Crave. You will watch it with your mouth open the entire time like I did. Did I just see that? I can't believe I just saw that, but I saw it. And that's it uh, for the show here today. I'm Talia Schlanger. I'll be hanging out with you, sitting in for Elamine Abdul-Mahmoud all week. So I will see you next time. I'll see you tomorrow. 